Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. My name is Noah July. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah show kicks off this hour. Phone lines 855-450-NO, 855-450-6624. The email spell, my name right, live at asknoahshow.com. Joining me, my co-host, Mr. Steve Ovens. Welcome in, sir. Good evening, Noah. Hey, you know, off the top, I was Mm -hmm. thinking about a project that doesn't get much love, but I use pretty frequently have you ever heard of meld i have not tell me about meld meld is a visual diff tool that i have been using for a very very long time and uh, every time i fire it up i am very thankful that this project exists uh, because windows has a lot of really good visual diff tools Uh uh-huh and i really i think meld does a fantastic job so i just wanted to give them a little plug out there because they just kind of, kind of like Gedit. It just kind of does its job and continues to uh, serve its function. That's cool. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes podcast at asknoahshow dot com. Steve, I had a project that sucked me in as well. I so I, I told you a little bit about my escapade with VMs and that I'd set up VMs mostly for the purpose of having a configured go to place that I was just moving ready, and it was great, but. One of the not so great side effects was I sort of got myself addicted to i3, Steve. Addicted to i3. Yeah, I did. I So I started inside of a VM on my personal side and I, I had all my personal stuff set up and I was using i3 just to, cut, you know, play around a little bit. And then I noticed I'm, I'm a fairly distractible person and I know, shocking, but I found that using i3 and having it set up to where I can just jump to one workspace or the other and have every window perfectly laid out for me, I found myself thinking to myself, well, there's never really been a time when I've wanted to have one window stacked over the other. And so as I've kind of dug in, there are some things that have surprised me. Like, for example, multi-monitor support. The first answer I found off the internet was to use XRander to set up your displays. And at first I was a little off put by that. I thought, man, it's kind of weird that they don't have like utility or doesn't figure it out automatically or whatever. But now I've kind of gotten into the thing of like, okay, so display port one is connected and has this resolution and it's to the right of, or to the left of display port two. And so without ever plugging my laptop in, I can go into my I3 config, change the display configuration, plug in to the display, reload my config and all of a sudden I'm outputting to a monitor and you know what my success rate is 100. It works 100% of the time. And so I reloaded my work machine. I think there's a couple of people that think I'm absolutely nuts, but now I've got, I have arch running as my base OS with I three on top. And that's been my daily driver now for this is we're going on day three. Interesting. I've always been very interested in the tiling window managers, but there's, there's just something about, getting used to a utility, which is weird from a person who lives in the terminal (laughs) all day, every day for the last 20 years. I I get it, right? And I used to play around with with XR and R uh, as well back in the day when you had to. I Mm -hmm. also, you know, remember the days when you had to set up your XOR config all proper. Like, I just, for whatever reason, just never wanted to go back to that. Yeah, because you don't miss it, because nobody misses it. Yeah, exactly. No, but the, the tiling window thing does it does strike me it always has struck me as interesting. Yeah, I I had for a while I had in my office I had a tiling window manager and if I was going to sit down and do like a long stretch of work, I would go in there and work, but I've since jettisoned all of my my desktops and gone to just Thunderbolt docks everywhere. And with that has meant that I can't I I couldn't up until three days ago, stomach the idea of having to think when using my laptop. Like if I sit down, I can't be sitting in front of somebody and they're like, here, pull this email up. Hold on a second. I got to remember what my launch key is to, or what workspace that is. Like it just didn't seem practical to me. What I'm finding is the more I use it, the more I'm kind of getting set up of like, oh, five in the middle of the keyboard. That's my file manager. Zero. That's all my communication stuff. One, that's all my web browsing. And I've kind of got little spots now organized for everything and 
I'm just really loving the heck out of i3. So if you haven't tried a tiling window manager, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but I promise you in the end, it's way more efficient. Our first email this week comes in from Nathan. Nathan writes in and says, Hi, no one, Steve. I've been using wise cameras in my home for a few years now. They're cheap, they're reliable, but they're not private. To fix this, I have cameras on smart switches that are controlled by Home Assistant and automation. Basically, the cameras don't have power when somebody is home. As soon as everyone's gone, the power is restored. I hope the folks at Wise enjoy seeing my cat from around the house as much as I do. Thanks, Nathan. This is, Steve, if I may say, the exact right approach to privacy and technology, right? He does he doesn't ignore the privacy concerns of a camera of, of a particular brand or a particular make or anything like that. He's just leveraging what he understands about technology. That is to say, if it's not on, I can't be recording you leveraging what he knows about technology to be able to get the best deal inside of his house. You know what? I mad props to this. This is, this is totally MacGyver. Mm -hmm. Like we had a situation. I worked around it. I love it. Yep. hundred percent. Our second email comes in from tiny tiny says, hi Noah and Steve. I have the Armcrest HD 410. And it does work locally with the Shinobi via ONVIF. I've not gotten PTZ working in Shinobi, but motion detection, viewing, and recording all works fine. You can integrate Shinobi with Home Assistant to get motion alerts via Home Assistant. The cameras direct, the cameras connect directly to Home Assistant to view them and receive motion alerts, but I should still be hooked up to an NVR for recording. The Armcrest app does have some smarts, like detecting a human instead of just motion. The app does phone home. So another option for cameras if you're looking for cameras for your home and a way to record it i'm ex i'm particularly interested in hearing from those of you who are using shinobi so shinobi if you're if you if you just started following along is a nvr that is open source-esque we'll say they have their own license which makes me a little nervous and they charge for their commercial offering which in principle i don't mind but see the my previous thoughts on they have their own license and i think that's weird but I'm excited to see that it has some traction and the, the UI just looks fantastic. Our second email comes in from a third email comes in from Jeremy. Jeremy writes in and says, Hey, no one, Steve, I love the show. It's great for all the time I spend on the road. I've been using home assistant for the past few years, running on a raspberry Pi three plus, and I know I need to move on to some better hardware, but it just keeps going. My question revolves around outdoor decorations. Last year, I automated some decorations around Christmas to come on in the morning and shut off at night using Zigbee. Now, here in Nebraska, much like where you live, we get a lot of wind, and some of the time, the decorations get damaged. This year, I'm using Open Weather Map and using their API to understand what the weather is doing and then shutting off the inflatable decorations if the wind speed gets over 15 miles an hour. So far, so good. What I would really like to know is, how do I get notifications from Home Assistant? I hear people talking about them all the time, but I can't seem to find a place for Home Assistant to send notifications to my phone. I'm using an iPhone, but I also have an Android, and that doesn't seem to work either. I'm sure I'm just missing an integration or a setting somewhere, but when I go into the notification center for Home Assistant, there's nothing there. And I would really like to set up notifications so that it tells me the wind speed is above 15 miles an hour. That way I can check the cameras and Home Assistant, verify the decorations are shut off. Thanks for all you do, Jeremy. So Steve... What, how, how do home, explain it to me like I'm an eighth grader. How do notifications work in Home Assistant? So in general, the way that it works is you have to have the Home Assistant app and it does a push notification to mm. you. So do I have to be uh, on my local network then for that to work? Yes. If, uh, you know, we, we use TailScale on our phones and stuff like that, but you either have to have the cloud instance, uh, like the the Nebocast a subscription sort of thing where it kind of works through and will then ping your phone or you can you can choose to set up your own kind of integration so for example i've i've set up the telegram sender um, i should caveat this by saying the only way that i'm familiar with doing both of those methods is to use node red i'm sure that it's exposed somewhere in the home assistant automation ui which is getting better all the time mm -hmm. but i kind of learned node red and stuck with it and it just makes more sense to my brain mm -hmm. and so um the note to set up a telegrams notification for example you set up a room you join your people to the room and then essentially there's a there's a thing in 
in Telegram that's called the Bot Father, and it'll give you the key to the room so that you can push it via an API. Mm -hmm. And then you you simply plug that information into Node Red and know that it supports Signal. And there, sorry, there are nodes for Signal and all the other kind of messaging platforms that are out there. Mm -hmm. So pick your poison in terms of which one you're going to actually. Uh, start implementing so his choices are he either sets up a vpn or something to get the the app to connect then he can get native push notifications or you go the route of some sort of third-party messenger yeah a lot of people like the text messaging one there there are mm. several of those out there um they the names escape me you'd recognize the names because they're not just for telegram they're for whatever you used mm -hmm. to use them for raspberry Pis back in the day to get notifications off of them so um yeah that's essentially my understanding is if you want to use the push notification, you either have to have the Nebacasa subscription or you have to have a VPN into your house because your home assistant's going to try and ping your phone directly. So the downside of that push notification is when I switch my phone, for example, you actually have to call. So I have a 4A and then I've got a, a Pixel, I don't even remember, 6A. Uh -huh. And... I didn't switch the notification to my active phone. And so the 4A oh. is still getting pinged because it says, okay, which instance of the Home Assistant app should I send this to? Right? And you're because, still on your old phone, or at least it thinks you're still on your old phone. Yeah. Well, my old phone is still kicking around and yeah, yeah. still has the Home Assistant app on it. So sure. it's still a valid sending point. So yeah. I'll be interested if he writes back in and lets us know what you do. Of course, I'm going to make a plug for... Uh, the matrix assistant interestingly enough this week there was a in the new 23.10 release the pull uh, the pull request for the matrix integration called matrix neo nio uh was merged so previously there was the matrix integration the uh, this new guy parith shah i believe is his name submitted the matrix neo and as part of that got merged in and so essentially you add this integration and notifications will come into a, a matrix room. One of the things that's nice about the matrix integration is it will also listen to reactions. So for example, you can say something like, Hey, the wind is approaching 10 miles an hour. You haven't hit your threshold of 15 to automatically shut it off. Did you want to preemptively shut it off? And if you give it a thumbs up, you know, it'll automatically shut it down. If you give it a thumbs down, it won't that sort of thing. And so the ability for two way interaction, the nice thing is going, third-party messenger route is then you're not having to deal with a tunnel and or a persistent connection back to your home you just monitor messaging like you'd ordinarily monitor messaging and home assistant will ping you just like anybody else will rv writes and in fact we got a number of emails from people responding to the millimeter wave thing which i, I was thrilled about so rv writes in and says you guys should show, totally check out the Atom pre-flashed ESP home millimeter wave human presence sensor that works with Home Assistant, and he links to it on AliExpress. It works amazingly well with Home Assistant and runs the ESP home firmware. What's great about this is it has a PIR and a millimeter wave detector in the same device. Millimeter wave looks, works like radar and can detect people in the room, even if they're not moving at all. Also, Slice, it runs ESP home, means you can actually modify the firmware by editing a YAML file, meaning you can super easily add features to it uh, or other sensors, if you like. It connects to your network via Wi-Fi. The only real downside is it needs constant power because millimeter wave uses quite a lot of power. The upside is you don't need to replace the batteries all the time. So a couple of things there, I'm going to go backwards. So the, the, the first thing I would say is I like the, I, I don't necessarily mind having to run power to it. I actually prefer things to be hardware. So I don't necessarily see that as a downside do we just need a clean way to do that the other thing is so far as i understand uh the the main esp home dev is employed by nebocasa and so when you connect those devices into home assistant home assistant now knows what those devices are and knows what the latest firmware for them is and can just push it down so what we asked was for a home assistant first class citizen for motion detection, I think that's what RV has provided. What do you think, Steve? I definitely am interested in in this with the ESP Home since since um, I last year sometime. I think it was last August they absorbed the ESP Home project as part of a, I guess you could say a buyout where that they just 
took over stewardship of it and they now pay the developers to work on ESP home. So That's great. you can't get much more native integration with home assistant than a project that that is actually a part of their project. So uh, question, so. because you, I feel like you and I share the same views on, on, on network and internet traffic and that sort of thing. Does it, does it concern you to have a bunch of things just floating around with IP addresses on your network? Mm, well, because I end up segregating them off onto their own VLAN. Oh, you do? Not okay. really. Okay. Okay. So, all right. That answered my, uh, but so there would be a concern if it were on the internet. Our fourth email comes in from David, kind of along the same thing. Just listen to the latest episode where you talked, you were looking for a motion sensor that would work natively with Home Assistant. Well, I think you missed Innovelli's announcement. In April earlier this year, and then he links to the Home Assistant blog that talks about the Innovelli blue switches that contain a millimeter wave and human presence detection. They're both blue and red version of the switch, and then he links to the other version. There are still some Indiegogo options left, but I think they're available for pre-order from Innovelli. And then he links to the Innovelli site. This builds a sensor right into the light switch, so that may not cover all of your needs, and there may be a requirement for an extra sensor depending on your house and the location of the light switch. But this gets you, hope this gets you as excited as I am for this to ship. Innovelli has been on my radar for a while. They've been so hard to get their hands on. I love that they work closely with Home Assistant to make all of the integrations work. So that was what originally drew me to them for their switches was that the integration with Home Assistant is great. You do all the configuration from Home Assistant. But the other thing, if I'm being perfectly 100% honest, the reason I wound up with Innovelli switches is because I had a friend who had like 40 Innovelli switches and had automated his whole house. Then he moved into a rental house and he's like, well, someday I'm going to put switches back in, but I'm not doing it in this rental house. And oh, by the way, when I buy my permanent house, maybe there'll be something else entirely that I want. And so one of my buddies that is going crazy with home automation right now bought like 20 of the switches and then he was like hey do you want one and i was i was like yeah sure give me one so i got a really good deal on an end of least, which was how i wound up with it so but it's been fun to play with and i'm thrilled to see that this company is making sensors because so far my experience with the end switches I would have a hard time articulating to you what the quality difference between the Innovelli switch and the $200 Lutron switch are. I would put them so far in roughly kind of the same boat. We'll see how it holds up over time. But the, the only thing I don't like about this, and I think, Steve, we talked about this a little bit last week, is I do like the idea of being able to separate presence detection from the control point because those aren't always the same thing. Yeah, I, I guess I could see that. To me, this makes a lot of sense. I guess because I already have a bunch of Z-Wave switches in my wall that specifically went out to get the PIR sensors in them. And by mm -hmm. the way, those work fantastic. And which ones do you have and that you're happy with? I have uh, the GE and Brighton ones. Okay. And they, they're fantastic. I really like them. These, these suckers got, a, they have range. I don't know how to describe it other than I'm, they go 100%. They do 180 degrees, uh, from from corner to corner so i don't know how to how far do you think you'd say from the top of the stairs to to my office is maybe oh my 20 gosh. or 30 feet something yeah, like that about that so take another 20 feet and go into the next room and when i get up in the middle of the night uh, out of my side of the bed i just barely cross the threshold um <laughs> going through and uh -huh. I trigger this this motion sensor at 180 degrees See? from 50 feet away. That's <laughs> what you want. That's how you get the spousal approval factor. When it works every time. When you don't but before you even know what you're doing, the home automation is ahead of you knows what you're doing. That's how you know yep. you won. I love it. Uh, do you know these Innovelli switches, mm -hmm. do they they're they're a rocker switch but are they dimmable? Like yes. I haven't been able to see that. They are definitely dimmable. Mhm. Mm yeah, in fact, the little LED, it's like a colored LED light that goes along the thing. And so you get like, let's say, eight stages for the you know various degrees of, of brightness. And so by default, it just shows you what those LEDs are. But you can reprogram that LED to do things like flash red for alerts or something like that. And That's so you can use it as a... Yeah, it is. It's kind of neat. So anyway, I, I this is going to be an evolving thing. It's not like this is a one and done thing. And I'm interested in the open discussion. I'm interested of you. I want to hear what you're using, what your experience has been with it. Does it work well? And is it a first class citizen and home assistant live at asknowashow.com sharper zero four seven six in the chat room says, hi, no, and Steve, I'm planning to use Alpine Linux to host 
my OS for Docker containers. What are your thoughts? I'm just looking for options to run a safe OS from a Docker container for different services, such as Jellyfin, Sir XNG, Nginx, and Proxy Manager, etc. So, Steve, you're a pragmatist when it comes to containers. You are not a containerize all the things. So, what is your line in the sand? When do you put things into containers? And when do you say, no, nah, I think I'll use a VM there? So, it goes in a container when it makes life easier exceedingly more uh, comfortable for me from the standpoint of, so you get a vendor that provides a container and maybe they run a specific version of FFmpeg, like in the case of Jellyfin, or maybe they want a specific version or a patch version version of Python that you don't want floating around polluting your system. And yes, for the Pythonistas, I know there's virtual OMV, <laughs> but, um, that that's kind of my line in the sand. Otherwise, I tend to, if they're important enough for me to run quote unquote in production, they kind of get their own VM to be segregated. Now I might run a container in that VM maybe, but generally speaking, I don't like to have just a bunch of Docker things on a single host. If I'm going to do a bunch of Docker things, honestly, I'm going to go with OpenShift or Kubernetes, uh, where I get some benefit of sliding it around so that if I have to tinker around with a host, I don't accidentally take down everything that happened to be sitting on that thing. Is is Kubernetes something you would say is worth for somebody who, you know, because I mean, it sounds like this is going to be his, I mean, his home, his IT home is going to live on this one box. So is that maybe something to look into so that he has the capability of sliding those containers around? Well, if he's only got one box, you're not sliding them anywhere. <laughs> no, really. But well, sure. By definition, yeah, they're they have no place to slide to. They're stuck on one ice rink. In terms of like being a light lightweight, if you want to, if you're interested in kind of kicking the tires with Kubernetes and you don't want to do something heavy, there's a there's a project out there called K3s instead of K8s, um, which is a much lighter version, a much more opinionated version of Kubernetes. I should say that, but It'll kick. It'll allow you to kick the tires. It gets it spinning up and going in less than five minutes, and it runs on a single node, and it gives you the experience of playing around with it. Honestly, if I was going to, um, if I was going to do this, I would run. I would run a single node of something like my Wiki JS. Mm -hmm. I put it in a container because they publish a container, and that sits on top of a single node OpenShift. So it doesn't slide anywhere, but it it sits on top of that because. Um, well, there's a number of reasons that, that I'd eat into our time if I went that far. If you start with a single node, Steve, can you down the road go, oh, I bought another machine and then add a node to the Kubernetes cluster and then give yourself slidey capacity? Yes, you can. Okay. Yep. Cool. So that'd be something to consider. Um, hopefully that helps you. If you have more specific questions, we would love to answer it. Um, just give us a little bit more. Th oh, Alpine Linux. What do you think about using Alpine Linux for the host? I'm not exactly sure why I would do this over an immutable OS like there's there's Fedora or there's CoreOS or um, I suppose if you're one of those hippies, you could even go with NixOS. Like I'm, I'm not exactly sure what Alpine buys you that a host that was specifically designed to run containers or to be immutable um, doesn't get you. So if you have... If you have Alpine experience or you want to learn it, sure, no issues, right? It'll do the job. It's a little bit of an oddball distribution relative to everything else in terms of where it puts things and how you do package management and stuff like that. But if that's your jam, I have no specific qualms against it. Penguin Prince in the chat room says, I believe I found the VTuber software I was looking for the other week. It's more of a 2D VTuber but it's a start. So this comes back to the question that was called in last week, the week before, uh, which somebody called in and said, hey, I'm looking for to do privacy conscious streaming where I want a moving animated avatar. I don't want it to be my face. Is there software that is open source friendly that works? So I'd be interested, Penguin Prince, if you could write back in and let us know what software you landed on so that we can share it with everybody else. That would be helpful. Sunjam replied and said, a caller asked about that avatar for streaming software without showing their face. And I heard good things about this one. And he links to V-E-A-D-O dot tube, which generates in, you know, an animated avatar and allows you to stream without showing your face. 
Tiny asks in the Geek Lab, you can too, going to geeklab.ninja. Hello, I mentioned in chat last week that I was needing to change SSH host keys when deploying an image to multiple machines, and I think there was some misunderstanding. SSH host keys are different than the SSH keys to use to access the machine, and so he goes into an explanation. So really where our confusion was, he was talking about the machine's fingerprint. I understood his SSH keys to mean like the private and public key pair used for authenticating access to the box. So the short version is, I, I guess let's start here. Steve, can you explain what a fingerprint is? Like when you connect, when we SSH into machine and it says the fingerprint is, and then it gives you a bunch of hash that you, ghibli, ghibli, that you don't understand. And then it says type yes or no. And we all type yes, because that's the way that we're able to connect. What are we really doing there? So that's a cryptographic signature for the box. And essentially when you install SSH, it generates some entropy and does some stuff to essentially create a cryptographic signature that is unique to that host. And I was just on the pre-show, I was kind of sharing with, you know, I remember back in the day when computers were slower and you'd actually watch the entropy being generated the first time that you did an SSH install because you know, nowadays you blink and it's it's done. Mm -hmm. And if if it pauses, you think that your computer's frozen or something like that, because <laughs> most people have no experience with that. But essentially, if you end up cloning a VM, you're cloning that as well. And that lives in the uh, Etsy SSH directory. And there is a way to regenerate it. And off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I've had to do that in the past. It's something that you'd have to build into your like VM cloning migration flow in order to correct that. So on Ubuntu, you can remove the host keys, Etsy slash SSH slash SSH underscore host, and it'll either be host underscore RSA underscore DSA underscore key uh, dot pub, something like that. And so you'll kill that. Then you'll run dpackage dash reconfigure space open SSH dash server. We'll have all this for you in the show notes of podcast.asknoahshow.com. Now, if you're not on Debbie, if you're not on Ubuntu, then you can either reconfigure the package or you can even do a reinstall. I also found, take this for what it's worth because it came from an internet post, but I found a guy saying you can open that that file and because it's just rando garbage data anyway, you can just generate rando garbage data. And if doing that could potentially, I don't know, Steve, maybe ansibleize something to make that happen? Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that you'd be, if the Ansible SSH module doesn't have something for this, then mm -hmm. you definitely would be able to um, shell out a command mm -hmm. and and just run the commands that are specific to your distribution. So that's probably what we would do. Um, check that out. Let us know if that doesn't work. And uh, and right back in. Torched ESC, also known as Jeff, asks, to the question I asked last week about presence detection, this is a bit more do-it-yourself, but it's made by a fellow Hass and a YouTuber. And he links to uh, Everything Smarter, Everything Presence 1. Uh, so we'll have a link to both the GitHub account with the project, as well as all of the parts you need uh, that you can buy from his site at everythingsmart.io and a link to the guy's YouTube channel where you can check out uh, what he has going on. From the Linux Newswire newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. For the week of October 1st, 2023, here's the Linux and open source news. The lightweight distribution Porteous releases version 5.01 with a Linux 6.5 kernel. Firefox 118 has been released with a new in-browser translation feature. Linux Mint Debian Edition 6 is now out, and Rhino Linux 2023.3 has been released. The gaming-focused distro Chimera OS Linux has released version 44 with improved support for various handhelds. Wine 8.17 has been released with initial Wayland support. And the professional doll Studio One by PreSonus is now available on Linux as a public beta. As OpenZFS 2.2 approaches this release, OpenZFS 2.1.13 is released with Linux 6.5 compatibility. And AMD FSR 3 is now available, and AMD has confirmed that the source code will be released soon and will remain under an MIT license. In security news, Google has released libvpx 1.13.1 as the newest update to the open source reference encoder for the VP8 and VP9 video codecs due to a CVE which was rated as a high security vulnerability and was exploitable within at least the Google Chrome web browser. And recently, Windows users installing the Bitwarden password manager may have inadvertently installed a remote access Trojan through a spoofed website. Thankfully, the Linux and Mac installers were not targeted. 
In open source AI news, Minstrel AI has released its new open source LLM. And rumors are circulating that Meta's next Llama model may not be open source. OpenFold Drug Discovery AI Research Consortium, whose goal is to develop free and open source software tools for biology and drug discovery, has announced the funding of a large-scale protein data collection at Professor Gabriel Rockland's laboratory at Northwest University. And lastly, the Jellyfin Project has put a call out for developers. So I'm going to actually piggyback right off of that last one, JT, the Jellyfin call for developers. Jellyfin published a blog article, and if you haven't done so, I invite you to read it. We'll have a link for you in the show notes of podcast.asknoahshow.com. Short version goes, read something like this. The short version is the Jellyfin project is really in need of contributors for a while in just about every area, development, bug fixing, triggering, reproducing issues, UI, UX design, translation, the list goes on. We've debated but hesitated making a public call for quite some time, being that it's Hoctoberfest season. We're now thinking we're aware of some of the forthcoming limitations on the parts of the team due to personal and professional changes. Ironically, after the first post is written, we felt it was finally time. Ironically, this blog post started out as something I'd planned to self post here. but We felt a big blog post, full blog post would be better in the long term. So here we are. For those of you who don't know, I'm Joshua, and then he goes on to introduce himself and largely says that nobody gets paid for work at Jellyfin. And by design, they're not backed by a company or any organizations with their own agenda. They have no monetization plan or anything of the sort, and they actively avoid bug bounties. That is to say, they actively avoid taking money from people who ask them to fix specific problems. To say, I will hire a developer to fix a problem for the project. They're against that. Jellyfin isn't a product in the commercial sense of the word, and while they do take donations, they only cover the infrastructure costs and rare pieces of developer client hardware as needed. They don't pay developers out of donations and never will. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I've had the Jellyfin folks on the program. I love what they do. I'm glad that there's an open source alternative, but... Respectfully, I think where there's a bit of a blind sight in their project's leadership is they talk about how the team behind Jellyfin is under strain. And from just one dude on the outside looking in, it would appear anyway that that strain is perhaps caused by the fact that developers have to maintain a full time job and they have to feed their family and pay rent and buy groceries and all of the things. And so by not being able to take any money in from the Jellyfin project to a degree, I question if that project has somewhat of a shelf life. Steve, am I being too harsh? I'm not really sure because it could have a long tail of, of passionate community people where, you know, because of the, because of the ethos they've set up around the project, it's possible that it'll have a long tail because it's going to attract people that will want to do that. Not only that, it's possible that as Plex becomes more mm, business focused, that Jellyfin is going to just step up or someone's going to fork the Jellyfin code and, you know, move forward in a more progressive way that mm. the community would like. That That's ultimately the strength of open source. Is mm -hmm. right? I don't see the validity of Jellyfin disappearing. I see rather someone forking or or building on what they've built if the original project doesn't end up going in the direction that it where the community is looking for it to go well said so best of luck to them if you have available time if you have available resources if you're willing to help out code debug all the things please reach out to the jellyfin people uh, we'd love to see them get some support to the jellyfin fo folks i would implore you in the strongest possible way to do some deep soul searching and ask yourself, what is the best way for you to guide your project? And maybe, you know, because you guys are the ones that have taken it from a place where it was overrun by corporate greed. And I understand that. And, and I can sympathize and empathize, but I think a part of a really good projects outline and a, and a part of, of good project leadership is making sure to take care of the people that are doing all of the work. And part of that means getting those people paid and making sure that they're not being asked to make larger sacrifices to, to work on, on the project. If, if they are, that's fine. I just think it has a shelf life. So with me today is the VP and GM 
of In-Vehicle Operating System and Edge at Red Hat. Francis, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you, JD, for having me. So In-Vehicle Operating System, why don't you take a moment and just kind of encapsulate that for me? So what we're doing here is to look at what the automotive industry needs today. As you, you have seen, the cars are getting more modernized. Mm -hmm. But if you compare what technologies are in a car today, let's say compared to your personal devices, mm -hmm. it's still lagging probably five to 10 years behind. One of the main reasons is that, uh, number one, it takes a long time to design a car, right? And also there's very rigorous safety requirements mm -hmm. on how a vehicle is being designed. But the key thing is the way software systems have been, and generally kind of hardware and software systems are, are being designed in a car traditionally, doesn't allow fast innovation to happen and doesn't um, really capture the modernized software development mm -hmm. uh, process. And so what we're trying to bring is, it is a lot of these challenges we have helped customers and partners solve in the, in the data center. Why don't we bring these tools and, and software infrastructure to the automotive world mm -hmm. to help them address these challenges so that automakers and their ecosystem can innovate faster to sort of catch up the, the, what the customers are asking for in terms of what they expect technologies are being in a car. So I think the first question that always comes to mind when people kind of hear this idea is, why does my car need an OS? I mean, isn't it just a, a complex state machine, mechanical state machine that I'm working with? You know, historically, you know, the engine management system, the infotainment, the safety, they've all kind of been segmented off in their own, in their own ecosystems. What advantage is there to kind of, kind of blending that all together, bringing it together into an OS? Well, you, you write about traditionally the cars of mm -hmm. design. Yeah. I'm glad that you understand that, right? They're probably somewhere between 50 to 150, uh, what they call embedded control units. Okay. And each of these control units serve like one specific functional purpose. Right. Now, as you can imagine, putting that together requires a lot of coordination mm -hmm. and integration work. But the longer term challenge is, is this model of development is not very scalable. Right? Even the same function, every time you have a new model or a new production year of the vehicle is not very reusable in mm -hmm. terms of components. So what we're advocating is that, hey, traditionally these runs on smaller uh, silicon that are less capable. Now we have very powerful silicons. Right. Why don't we consolidate these ECUs from 50 to 150 to let's say five, two to five very powerful computers. And then instead of having these bespoke functions have a platform, just like a server, mm -hmm. that with that server, you can run many applications, including your infotainment center, your digital cockpit, or your driver assistant systems. And okay, if you're gonna build that supercomputer, then you need an, an operating system to help manage the hardware resources. Right. And this is where we come in. Okay, so to follow up on that, you know, obviously many current car systems, they're all, they are all segmented because we don't want a failure in one to cause a failure in another. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, if I'm driving my car down the road, I don't want a sensor going bad to cause a kernel panic so then my by wire steering and brakes go out. So how do you guys address that challenge of bringing everything together, but yet also making sure that they can't compromise the, each other part, the other parts? So what you just described is actually part of the safety standard that we're okay. tackling to, to achieve. So there is a, a safety standard for all vehicles uh, called ISO 26262, it's an mm -hmm. international standard. And part of the requirements is what exactly what you described called freedom from interference. Okay. Is that the function of a lower safety level uh, cannot interfere with the function of a high safety level, even if that fails. Mm -hmm. And so part of our job as we design this uh, operating system is to make sure that that is compliant to the safety standards. And the good news is a lot of what we've been doing in Linux, uh, how you manage containers in C groups is exactly that, right? Okay. You give that isolation with containers mm -hmm. just natively because of how we've been designing okay. our enterprise systems. So I think that may actually have addressed my next question, which is security concerns. Um, you know, obviously, you know, any of us that work with computers, we know security is a big issue and we know that there's, you know, it's a multi-vector issue. It's not just like one problem you have to worry about. So. Like, I guess I would say, what 
has Red Hat done or focused on to address security issues like um, OTA updates that are compromised or somebody has a USB stick, you know, some music on it that they want to play when they're driving and they stick it in that that doesn't then compromise the rest of the, of the car. Um, obviously, you guys have thought about that. So like, where have you come to on, on that issue? I think the good news is we are bringing our security uh, expertise and, and track record mm -hmm. from the enterprise world to automotive, right? So Linux with things like SU Linux, right? We, we already are natively sort of securing the infrastructure. Okay. Definitely we're working with uh, our customers, automakers and, and their ecosystem to make sure that anything they need in the operating system, right? We'll help them kind of add in the feature set. And certainly a lot of things is out of our control, right? So right. we definitely need to work with the ecosystem to make sure that they do their part, we do our part. Okay. In the aerospace industry, obviously they have highly computationally based. There's computers all over the plane, all controlling things. Now, one of the things that in aerospace they do is they have multiple systems that run at the same time for consensus to make sure that if there is a failure, that it's okay, we can keep going. Are we going to see something along that lines in the automotive space, do you think? Or do you think because of just the differences between aviation and general transportation that that's not going to happen? I think it depends. Okay. Um, the reason being, uh, you're just talking about redundancy, right. Right? just in case something fails, right? The, the plane will still fry, which will be a good idea. I think for, for vehicles, the fact that we are moving to more of a kind of high power, high performance computer systems mm -hmm. compared to the, the standalone ECUs actually give you more options. Okay. Let's say if you have two powerful computers mm -hmm. and you can actually share some of these applications and functions and have a failover or if you have multiple systems. So I think the new approach of designing vehicles actually give automakers a choice to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are other things about, uh, Hey, as you actually build redundant systems, you can achieve a, a high safety level, even right. your subsystems have a lower safety standard. So this is another way to, uh, I think automakers now have a choice and say, hey, if I actually use, let's say, um, uh, there are four levels of safety mm -hmm. in the standard, A, B, C, D. Uh, and actually in the standard, you have a choice to decompose like a D, the highest standard into okay. two subsystems of B so that you can still achieve a, a system level uh, D. Now, the advantage of that is even though you might have a redundant system in your car that might not be cost effective, mm -hmm. but the development costs you save could okay. offset that. So so that's an interesting trade-off I think the industry will, will figure out in the coming year. Okay, so speaking of development, I wanna talk about CICD for a little bit because generally CICD is pretty easy. You know, if you're working on a server or single board computer or one of those things, you're dealing with, you know, something small that you can relatively use wherever you are. When you're dealing with a car, that's a very complex piece of machinery that you need to ideally have multiple copies of so you can test in different environments and different situations. How have you guys kind of addressed this to overcome the difference between actual development because of the hardware changes? What I think you're right about the hardware. Uh, part of the challenge is that the hardware in the car is usually different from the hardware of the server that's doing the testing, right? And I think some of the values that we're trying to bring is that uh, with our platform, we actually actually make it more consistent. Okay. That the, the same platform runs in the car can be the same platform that runs in the cloud for testing or mm -hmm. whatever on-prem servers uh, customers use. Certainly, uh, there's still a process to kind of get there, but our goal is to provide that consistency so that, you know, if you want to build an app, test an app, you can actually test it in the cloud and as if you are, you're testing on, on road vehicles. Um, the other thing that's going to happen is, is we are actually working with our prospect customers and, mm -hmm. and partners on building those CICD flow tests kind of end to end. Um, you can imagine, right, as multiple partners are working on the same project, right. we all have our roles and responsibilities on different pieces of the CICD flow. Mm -hmm. Now, the key thing is how do we piece that together? So it's just really a, a complex process, but we, we actually understand uh, what needs to be done, mm -hmm. and we're working with our customers to address those. That's great. So one of the things that's come up a lot in the news recently is kind of around the right to repair issue, because we've seen manufacturers like John Deere that have really computerized a lot of the vehicle that they sell. But at the same time, they also re do far more to restrict users' capabilities to actually use They restrict users' capabilities 
to be able to kind of own their own hardware. Um, now, obviously, this is going to be a concern to a lot of people. I guess my question for you would be, do you see this as kind of an inflection point that would allow owners more observability and control of their own vehicles or something that could unfortunately turn the other way and become more restrictive? I think it is our goal to support open source mm -hmm. licensing terms. Um, we definitely have been thinking about this and we also believe there are also ways to manage uh, okay. how, how do we enable end customers to actually right to repair and make changes, right? right? while maintaining the safety right off of mm -hmm. the owners of the vehicle uh, as an example right there there are ideas where okay maybe we can uh, open up uh, an easier process for drivers and consumers of vehicles to contribute to the code in a more controlled and safe environment mm -hmm. right that doesn't compromise their own safety because we all want to make sure that whatever product we're building with our customers and partners uh, eventually be safe on the road mm -hmm. with the owners now i know there are a lot of manufacturers that are kind of working towards developing similar uh, products like this uh, i know mercedes-benz has a huge github uh, repository that they're always releasing code on but red hat has announced a partnership with with gm can you tell me a little bit about that uh, we announced our, our partnership with GM uh, last year at mm -hmm. Summit, and uh, this is really a, a great collaboration effort uh, as GM wants to innovate uh, the way they build vehicles mm -hmm. uh, with software-defined vehicles, leveraging modernized tool chains and, 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 uh, and operating systems like Linux. So this is really uh, a joint effort uh, mm -hmm. for us to be the foundational layer of GM's end-to-end uh, -end software system, they call Altify. Mm -hmm. and being able to enable them to develop their applications much faster and being able uh, enable and enabling them to deploy applications and services once a vehicle is on the road much faster than they've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, I know GM has open sourced their protocol. They um, did. And they're part of the Eclipse Foundation. Have you heard about how the reception has been in the industry around more of that collaboration in the auto space? I have not heard particularly about the, the feedback about uh, GMs opening their the okay. uh, micro protocol uh, to to Eclipse, but definitely I think this is uh, an evidence, right? The industry is starting to appreciate the power of open source development, right? The fact that right a traditional automaker is now opening up their middleware right. to the world to help drive innovation. I think it's a great thing. Uh, what we're seeing is that over time. Our hope is that more ecosystem players can come together mm -hmm. and understand how they can leverage open source uh, operating model. Um, because if you can imagine, right, actually, you should just kind of take a look at, on how these uh, automotive joint ventures are done today, right? There are a lot of joint ventures right. uh, because the individual companies, right, don't have the skills they need to, to, to do some of these things. But just the amount of time it takes to create a joint venture with yeah. all the legal work is, I don't know, two years. Mm -hmm. What if you want to do open source collaboration? You can do it tomorrow. Right. Right. So the, that's the advantage of, hey, we see a need to drive innovation to go faster. Mm -hmm. We believe open source is the right way to do it. And GM is definitely in that right now. And we're hoping more companies will come and join us. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. So pulling back a little bit, this is an entirely new area for Red Hat. What challenges has there been? I mean, effectively, you've spun up an entire new ecosystem. Yes. That's got to be challenging. It is challenging. <laughs> but having said that, it's not like we're doing it in a welcome, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the interesting thing is what we've done in the telco industry. Conceptually, it's actually very similar to what we're doing now for automotive. Okay. Where you look at how telco systems have been built in the past decade. Hardware, software, tightly integrated, bespoke mm -hmm. systems. You got your you buy a packet core, you got your IMS, right? Now they're all running platforms, mm -hmm. right? So we're bringing that experience and expertise to automotive. Hey, you know, you have these ECUs, right? Why don't you have platforms? Right? Okay. In fact, my background is with mostly on the on telco side and you won't believe it the the first pitch i do to automakers is almost the same as the first pitch i do okay. in, uh, for, for telco customers so i want to ask you our, our final question is one that we like to ask kind of everybody is what do you feel about 
open source is the best thing? And what does open source mean to you personally? Open source actually is almost new to me, right? Okay. I'm at Red Hat for about two years. And prior to that, my whole life is in proprietary technology companies. So I, I haven't actually been paying a ton of attention to mm -hmm. open source uh, in my past careers. But I would say that now I, I'm sold. Okay. I, I had no idea how powerful open source is and, and how much it has actually has drive innovations mm -hmm. in the past decade. I mean, I, I pay attention to it, but not as right. much as, you know, being in it. So I, I truly believe this is the right model okay. to drive innovations. And we're actually starting to see that change of minds, not just in automotive industry, but in other industry that traditional have not used open source. Mm -hmm. So like in manufacturing, in retail, in defense, I think there's the more acceptance of industries to look at, hey, how do we leverage what's open out there to help them right, build systems that are faster while keeping track, right, or, or, uh, while allowing them to have their own proprietary solutions mm -hmm. if they so choose to. So coming to open source kind of fresh, was there like a moment that you kind of had that aha moment where it clicked and you're just like, oh, okay, now I see all the possibilities. Was there a single moment or was it just kind of a general change of, of thought over that two year period of being at Red Hat? I would say probably the first six months or so. Okay. Uh, it, it does take time to understand how Red Hat works. And uh, definitely the, the open culture is also quite different from mm -hmm. what I have experienced in the past uh, in other corporate, uh, in, in other corporate environments. Uh, but I, I would say that over that first six months or so, I, I start to appreciate more and, and then understanding open source is not just the commercial model. Because a lot of people thought, hey, open source is free, right? That's, that's a commercial thing. Right. But more importantly, it is, it's the collaboration model. Mm -hmm. right? It's the design approach that makes the most sense. Yeah, one of the ways that I like to explain it to people is it's effectively the scientific model. It's building on top of the work that others have done before you to create something new and share that with everybody so people can build on top of what you have. Yes, doing. absolutely. Well, Francis, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank, Thank you, JT. We really appreciate the opportunity. Great. The Raspberry Pi 5 is out, and it is awesome. Powered by a Broadcom BCM 2712 2.4 GHz quad core 64 bit ARM Cortex A76 processor, 512 kilobytes per core of L2 cache, 2 megabytes of shared L3 cache, and a video core V2 GPU ca capable of supporting OpenGL ES 3.1, Vulkan 1.2. It also comes with dual. 4K 60p HDMI output and 4K 60p HEVC decoders. This is a welcome change after four years, obviously getting a little bit of love. Additionally, the Raspberry Pi Foundation for the first time has introduced something called the Southbridge chip. And this is known as part of the chipset that helps the device communicate with other peripherals through the RP1 Southbridge. And so the Raspberry Pi Foundation says that this will deliver a change in peripheral performance and functionality, enabling faster transfer speeds to external devices. Essentially, it opens up four lane 1.5 gigabits MyPi transceivers, which will let you connect up to two cameras or displays. There's also a new single lane PCI Express 2.0 interface for the first time, offering high bandwidth peripherals. You'll find it uh, available before the end of October. Price $60 for the 4 gigabyte variant, $80 for the 8 gigabyte variant. Of course, then you're going to have to add a bunch of accessories and stuff. So maybe the Raspberry Pi has lost its way. Music in our ears means we're out of time. Thanks for joining us. We record the show every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. You can learn more at AskNoahShow.com.